Hi, my name is Natalie Wexler, and I'm the author of a book called The Knowledge Gap and the co-author of The Writing Revolution with Judith Hockman. And I'm delighted to be speaking to all of you today. I wish I could be there in person. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I thought I would start by talking about how and why I came to write this book, The Knowledge Gap. And I really started about seven or so years ago now. Um, I was very interested in what we've come to call the achievement gap, the gap in test scores between students at the upper and lower ends of the socioeconomic spectrum. And I wanted to know why it had been so hard to make any progress in narrowing this gap. It really seemed incredibly important. And I started looking at the high school level because that is what seemed to be the problem. That's what everybody thought, including myself. That's where the scores were lowest, that gap was largest, and the students seemed to be the most disengaged. But what I stumbled upon in researching this problem was that what I had been told was the bright spot, primary school, or as we call it, elementary school, that was where many of the problems that become so apparent in high school actually begin. And what I'm mostly talking about here is reading and the way we approach it. Now, as I'm sure you are aware, there are two basic aspects to reading. One is decoding, sounding out words. That should be taught as a set of foundational skills, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, there are major problems with the way we approach teaching foundational skills in the United States and as I'm aware in Australia as well. I'm not going to focus on those problems. I'm going to talk about the other basic aspect of reading, comprehension, and you need both to become a good reader. And I would argue that the problems with the way we approach comprehension are even more widespread and better hidden than the problems with the way we approach decoding instruction. So what is the standard approach to teaching comprehension? Well, it's approached as a set of skills and strategies, skills like finding the main idea and details, determine author's purpose, um, make inferences. There are a whole bunch of these. And there's often a skill of the week that the teacher will focus on. First, demonstrating whatever the skill is on a text chosen not so much for its topic or its content as for how well it seems to lend itself to demonstrating that skill. And then students will practice these skills and strategies um, after having their individual reading levels determined. Um, and their individual reading levels could be years below their actual grade level. Um, and they will be directed to a basket of books that matches their individual reading level. And the theory is that if they get good at these skills, get good at finding the main idea through repeated practice, that they will be able to apply that skill or those skills to whatever text is put in front of them, whether it's a passage on an end of the year reading test or a textbook down the road in high school, um, that this is how they will become better readers. And it doesn't really matter so much what knowledge they may be acquiring as long as they're getting good at those skills. So let's test out that theory. I'm going to show you a paragraph taken from a newspaper, and I'm just going to ask you to find the main idea. So this shouldn't be too much of a challenge. So here goes. Sturzer completed the first inning on 19, point, 19 pitches and skipped around a one-out walk. He lost Matt Carpenter despite getting ahead zero to two. He struck out two, Tommy Edmond looking, Paul DeJong swinging, and got Nolan Arenado to fly out to left. In the second, he walked leadoff batter Dylan Carlson, induced a weak grounder, yielded a sharp single, and closed his outing with an infield fly. Now, if you're like me, that doesn't make much sense. I can't find the main idea. Usually what I do for this particular slide uh, is show a, par a paragraph describing a cricket match, because usually I'm speaking to Americans and they have no idea what that paragraph is trying to tell them. I didn't think that would work so well with an Australian audience, so I chose a paragraph describing a baseball game, and that's what this is. 
Now, if you were a baseball fan and understood all the terminology here, you would have no trouble understanding what this paragraph is trying to tell you. If you don't have that knowledge, this is pretty mystifying. Now, this is something that cognitive scientists have known about for a long time. In fact, uh, years ago, back in the 19, late 1980s, um, there was a study that has come to be known as the baseball study. Um, and the researchers wanted to test what is more important to reading comprehension. Is it knowledge of the topic or is it general reading skill or ability as determined by a standardized reading test? And they chose the topic of baseball because they figured there are quite a few kids out there, these were 12, 13 year olds, who are not generally good readers, but they do know a lot about baseball. And so they took these kids, divided them into four groups, depending on how well they had done on a standardized reading test and how much they knew about baseball. And then they showed them, gave them a passage to read about a baseball game and tested their comprehension. And what they found was that knowledge of the topic was really key. In fact, if you look at those two middle bars on this graph, the one on the left, the dark green one, those are the supposedly poor readers who knew a lot about baseball. And to the right, that blue one, those are the supposedly good readers who didn't know much about baseball. And as you can see, the uh, supposedly poor readers did a lot better when they knew about the topic. So this is pretty convincing evidence that what's really more important than general reading skill is knowledge of the topic. And this has been done, uh, similar studies have been done with a range of other topics and the same findings have come up. So what does this tell us? Well, a couple of things. Uh, one is comprehension skills aren't skills like riding a bike. They don't just get better with practice and you can ride any bike. It's gonna depend on the topic and the reader's knowledge of the topic to a large extent. Secondly, they tell us there's really no such thing as a fixed reading level because again, it's gonna depend on the topic and the reader's knowledge of the topic. And those things are not taken into account when kids' individual reading levels are determined or when a book is assigned a reading level. So um, that may be pretty clear with a specialized body of knowledge like baseball or cricket or you know, molecular biology. What may be less obvious is how much we draw on our knowledge of the world to understand so many things we read every day. So I, just to demonstrate that, I'm gonna show you another paragraph from a newspaper article, not about baseball. Um, and this time, I'm just gonna ask you to think about the knowledge that you draw on to make sense of this paragraph. Two appeals by the president in his private capacity and represented by private lawyers have reached the Supreme Court in the past week. One, Trump v. Vance, is a formal appeal from a ruling by the Federal Appeals Court in New York, upholding the validity of a grand jury subpoena obtained by the Manhattan District Attorney, Cyrus Vance, and served on the president's accountants for his personal and business tax records. Now, I can see quite a bit of knowledge is assumed here about the American legal system, and people in Australia may be missing some of that. Um, you need to know what the Supreme Court is. You need to know what an appeal is, what a federal appeals court is, what a grand jury is, what a subpoena is, what a district attorney is. You don't need deep knowledge about these things, but you need some passing familiarity at least with these terms, or you may be pretty lost. And this paragraph was not written for lawyers. This is written for general readers. It's just assumed that they'll have enough of this knowledge to make sense of the paragraph. So why does prior knowledge help so much with comprehension? Well, it basically has to do with working memory, which is key to a lot of aspects of learning. Working memory is uh, that aspect of consciousness that has to do with taking in new information and making sense of it. And the important things to know about working memory are that it can only hold a very few things, maybe as few as four items for a very limited period of time, maybe 10 to 15 seconds. And so if you're juggling a lot of things in working memory, you're gonna get overwhelmed and you won't have the cognitive capacity to, to really make sense of new information. The way around this is to have a lot of information stored in long-term memory, that is to have knowledge, um, 
once you have some knowledge stored in long-term memory, you can just withdraw it. You don't have to juggle it in working memory. You have more space for comprehension, for analysis. So for example, if you know what an infield fly is and you're reading a description of a baseball game, you don't have to think you know, what infield fly, you don't have to go look it up. You just withdraw that information from your long-term memory and you have more space to make sense of what you're reading. So that is the basic idea here. And it doesn't just help with comprehension, it also creates capacity for analysis and things like that. So what does all this have to do with testing, with standardized tests? Well, passages on reading tests, like any texts, make certain assumptions about what the reader is going to know. The reader is gonna to have to fill in some gaps in the information that is given because authors don't explain every term they use. That would make the writing really tedious. Passages on standardized reading tests are not designed to have anything to do with what kids have learned in school. In fact, they're designed to avoid those kinds of subjects because the idea is we're not testing their knowledge, we're testing their general reading comprehension ability. But of course, if you don't have enough background knowledge and vocabulary to understand the passage on the test, you don't get a chance to demonstrate those comprehension skills. And to give you an idea of what that could look like, uh, I'm gonna show you a paragraph from a third grade standardized reading test that was administered in the, in the United States. Here goes. In one of the most remote places in the world, the Canadian Arctic, a people have survived over a thousand years. They are the Inuit. For the Inuit, the Arctic is a place teeming with life. Depending on how far north they live, the Inuit find everything from caribou herds and polar bears to beluga whales. Now, to us as educated adult readers, that looks pretty straightforward. But now I'm gonna show you that same passage without the words and phrases that a lot of third graders won't know. And if you're missing that much information, this paragraph becomes as impenetrable as that paragraph about baseball was if you don't know much about baseball. Now, of course, some third graders will know these words and phrases or many of them. They tend to be the third graders who've been able to pick up that information outside of school, probably because they have more highly educated families. The other kids rely on school for that kind of information. And unfortunately in our current system, they're the least likely to get it there. Why is that? Well, especially over the past 20 years, the elementary curriculum has really narrowed to reading and math because that's what we've been supposedly testing. And so these other subjects, social studies and the arts, and to some extent science, have been marginalized or even eliminated from the elementary school curriculum, especially in schools where test scores are low. Because the theory is, well, if the kids aren't doing well on reading tests, we need to spend more time on reading. And that means largely reading, practicing reading comprehension skills and strategies. The irony or the problem here is that those subjects that have been eliminated, social studies, the arts, science, those are the subjects that are most likely to build the kind of academic knowledge and vocabulary that kids actually need to do well on reading tests and in life. So what does this have to do with high school? Why does it look like high school is the real problem? Well, that has to do with the fact that having prior knowledge or having academic knowledge and vocabulary, it doesn't just help with comprehension. It also helps you absorb and retain new information. It's been said that knowledge is like Velcro. It sticks best to other related knowledge. Some kids start out with more of that other half of the Velcro, with more academic knowledge and vocabulary. That enables them in our system to read more complex texts. It also enables them to absorb and retain more knowledge and vocabulary from those texts. And that in turn enables them to understand yet more complex texts and absorb and retain more vocabulary, et cetera. So for them, it can be kind of a vicious, not a, a virtuous cycle. But for the other kids who start out with less knowledge and vocabulary, first of all, they're relegated to simpler texts, but they also have less of that other half of the Velcro. So they're less likely to absorb and retain new information. And that's a vicious cycle for them. This has come to be known as the Matthew effect in reading, a uh, reference to the gospel of St. Matthew and the part that says the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. 
And so what this means is that every year that goes by, the gap between the good readers and the poor readers gets larger and harder to narrow. And by the time kids get to the upper grade levels, it can be extremely large and extremely hard to narrow. Um, and the problem is that it can look like that skills and strategies approach is working at lower grade levels, but the approach can backfire when students reach upper grades. At lower grade levels, students may be reading texts that don't assume a whole lot of background knowledge and vocabulary, so it can look like they're getting better at finding the main idea. But then when they reach the upper grades where knowledge, background knowledge is assumed, they often hit a wall because they haven't had a chance to acquire that knowledge. Now there's another gap that becomes apparent at upper grade levels, and that's the gap between what we assume high school students know and what many do know. And it's not uncommon in the United States for students to arrive at high school without ever having had any systematic exposure to history, to geography, to science, because this narrow focus on reading and math in schools where test scores are low can continue through age 12, 13, 14. And then they get to high school and they're expected to read and understand a textbook like this. And if you don't know the difference between a country and a continent, or you can't find your country on a map of the world or your city on a map of your country, if you don't have a sense of what history is all about and you don't have much historical knowledge, this is gonna be a very frustrating assignment to read this textbook, both for you and for your teacher. So that's why the problems become so apparent at the high school level. Now, when I stumbled upon this problem, the lack of content in the elementary curriculum and its ramifications, I was really surprised. Um, in fact, I didn't quite believe it for a while because I thought I knew a lot about education. I'd been writing about it as a journalist. I'd been reading all sorts of things. and I'd never heard about this as a problem. And now there were, as I eventually discovered, some people, a small group of people who were very aware of this problem and had been concerned about it for decades. But I realized that they were mostly just talking to each other. And I thought, Perhaps if someone wrote about this in a more journalistic and engaging way, it had been written about in a fairly academic way, it would help to get this issue into the public conversation about education. And so that is the book that I've tried to write, The Knowledge Gap. But I didn't write this book just to describe the problem. I also wanted to talk about what we can do about it. Where can we go from here? And the good news is that there is a lot that we can do, that teachers can do, administrators, policymakers. Um, so what can individual teachers do? Well, they can organize read alouds, not by the skill of the week, but by topic, and, and spend a couple of weeks on a particular topic, like sea mammals. Uh, that gives students a chance to hear the same concepts and the same vocabulary repeated in different contexts. That's what will help them retain that information stored in their long-term memory. Secondly, ask questions, discussion questions that put the content in the foreground rather than the skill. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that can be done. And then their classroom libraries, rather than organizing them solely by reading level. They can be organized by topic, and really by fairly specific topic. Uh, so here you can see, I think, these baskets that to some extent are organized by topic, but the topics are animals, plants, and even just nonfiction. Those are really broad. I mean, you may know something about sharks that may not help you read a book about ponies, but especially if you've spent a couple of weeks on a topic like sea mammals, try putting out a basket of books at a variety of reading levels on sea mammals. Remember the baseball study, once kids have learned about a topic through talking about it for a couple of weeks and hearing about it, uh, they may well be able to read at a higher grade level on that topic than you would expect. And be skeptical about reading levels for the same reason. Remember the baseball study. Um, so if a kid wants to tackle something at a higher reading level because he or she knows something about that topic, they should be given that opportunity. And then 
spend lots of time, if you can, on meaty social studies and science topics. Remember, those are the topics, those are the subjects that are the most likely to build the kind of academic knowledge and vocabulary that will enable students to understand a range of texts. It's not just topic knowledge, but general academic knowledge and vocabulary. The more of that you have, the more likely you're gonna to be to understand whatever text is put in front of you. But there's a limit to what individual teachers can do to narrow the knowledge gap. That's because knowledge building is a gradual cumulative process that really extends across grade levels. And of course, teachers, individual teachers don't have control over what happened the year before or what's gonna happen next year. So administrators and policymakers really need to step in. What can they do? Well, the most important thing they can do probably is to adopt a content-focused literacy curriculum that goes deeply into topics in social studies, science, and the arts. So these, this is not a substitute for classes in social studies or science and the arts, but it's important to reinforce that information. And of course, in many schools, time isn't really being made for, for those topics. The literacy curriculum is, a, is a one way, a highly effective way of getting kids exposed to that kind of content. In the United States, we now have several literacy curricula, elementary literacy curricula that cover these topics. And they differ, they all cover different bodies of knowledge and they impart that knowledge in different ways. But they all spend at least a couple of weeks on a topic giving kids a chance to absorb that information. And they all have the teacher, especially at lower grade levels, reading aloud to kids from books on these topics that are more complex than those children could read on their own. And that's really important. It's important to expose all children to the same knowledge, the same content, and to give all of them exposure to complex grade level text or even above grade level text. You know, we have been relying on reading as a way for kids to build their knowledge. Um, and that is not enough, especially when kids are still learning to read and they're still becoming fluent readers. There are other ways to build knowledge that are going to be more effective. One of those is listening. Listening is crucial, not only in building knowledge, but also in familiarizing students with the conventions of written language. Written language is almost always more complex than spoken language. And if eventually students are going to understand written language on their own and understand things like subordinate clauses and the passive voice, they need to hear that uh, in books that are read aloud. And a crucial fact to know here is that listening com comprehension exceeds reading comprehension on average through about age 14. It's not just when kids are really little. Kids up to that age and sometimes beyond, are going to be able to take in more complex, more sophisticated information and vocabulary through listening than through their own reading. But it's not just listening, it's also class discussion that's going to reinforce that knowledge, that's going to help it lodge in long-term memory. So class discussion is also crucial. And in a skills-focused classroom, a classroom focused on comprehension skills, it can be really hard to get a good classroom discussion going. That's one thing I learned uh, when I was doing my research for the knowledge gap. I, one of the things I did was I followed two early elementary classrooms. One focused on comprehension skills, the standard approach, and the other using one of these more recently developed content-rich uh, elementary literacy curricula. I don't have videos of these classrooms to show you, but I can show you posters. This is a poster from the comprehension skills focused classroom and all of the posters were on comprehension skills like this. And it was very hard for the teacher to get a good discussion going in this classroom because these were six year olds and they really didn't have much to say about the abstract idea of main idea and details or sequence of events or whatever. The content focused classroom on the other hand was covered, the walls, the windows were covered with posters that looked like this, just brimming over with content. This happens to be from the unit on Greek myths. This is on the myth of Daedalus and Icarus. These posters would be created collaboratively 
by the teacher and the students during and after the day the days read aloud. Uh, and there, the discussions in this classroom were really amazing. Um, these were seven-year-olds. They were highly engaged. They had a lot to say. They had some very thoughtful things to say about a range of topics. But I'd just like to point out a couple of things about this poster. One is the vocabulary that was being focused on, desperately, plummeted, foresight. Those are words that are sophisticated for any group of second graders. In this second grade classroom, most of the kids came from non-English speaking families. And yet they were learning and using words like these in their conversation and lodging those words in their long-term memories where they will serve them well in years to come. The other thing I'd like to point out about this poster is that it kind of looks like the teacher's teaching skills. It says, predict, what is Daedalus' plan? And there are these boxes that say cause and effect, but the teacher is not trying to teach the skill of making predictions or the skill of determining cause and effect. She's bringing those things in as a way of getting the kids to really think about the content. And that's what works, putting the content in the foreground and asking questions that require students to, to think about it in ways that involve those quote unquote skills. Another aspect of literacy and knowledge building that is really crucial and that often gets overlooked and not exploited well is writing. Um, writing has, has, can, is potentially incredibly powerful in a number of ways. Writing can familiarize students with those conventions of written language, learning, having them learn how to use them, and that will boost their reading comprehension. It can help them develop analytical abilities. It can build and deepen their knowledge quite powerfully. So powerfully, in fact, that it can compensate for gaps in background knowledge even at higher grade levels. But unfortunately, with the standard approach to writing instruction, many students don't get any of these benefits because the standard approach has been, uh, first of all, to have students often to uh, either write about personal experience or something that has nothing to do with the content of the curriculum, which is a wasted opportunity to build the kind of knowledge we want them to acquire. And secondly, we've asked kids usually ask kids to write at length from the very beginning, beginning in kindergarten. And we've really underestimated how difficult writing is. So in order to exploit the power of writing and to get students to learn to write well, we need to observe a couple of principles. How can we make writing easier and use it to build knowledge? First principle, to make writing easier, begin at the sentence level. If students have not learned to write a good sentence, don't ask them to write a whole essay. Among other things, that's going to impose a very heavy cognitive load. And secondly, embed writing activities in the content of the core curriculum. Now, I know of only one method that combines both of those principles, and that's the writing revolution. I'm not going to take much time to talk about the writing revolution because I understand that it's become quite popular in Australia and many of you may be familiar with it. Uh, but I do wanna just make the point that it's not just about writing, it really is about helping kids acquire knowledge and develop analytical abilities and boost reading comprehension. But of course, in order to exploit the power of writing to build knowledge, you have to have a content rich curriculum. Uh, the problem at the elementary level in many cases is that there's not enough information about any one topic to enable children to write even a decent sentence or two about it. So um, we really have to start there. But I don't wanna leave you with the impression that merely adopting a content rich curriculum is going to be enough. It's gonna be very different from what most teachers are used to. And so getting it implemented well can pose some challenges. One of those challenges has to do with testing. Um, as I mentioned, the standardized tests are not connected, they're deliberately not connected to any particular body of knowledge. So you maybe will have built your students' knowledge about Greek myths or the human digestive system or whatever, and you know they've acquired that knowledge, but they get to the test and the reading passages are about things like the Inuit. Now, at a certain point, kids will have acquired enough general academic knowledge and vocabulary that they should be able to read and understand 
pretty much any quote unquote grade level passage that is thrown at them. But it's impossible to predict in any given case when that point will be reached. So, you know, sometimes you'll, you may, you'll see quick results on standardized tests from building kids knowledge, but sometimes you won't. And that can be discouraging. It's important to bear in mind what those tests are really testing. And it is primarily background knowledge and vocabulary. Um, so eventually, if you build kids knowledge, the results will show up in standardized tests, but it can take a while. There are other obstacles as well to getting classroom practice to focus on content rather than comprehension skills and strategies. And I'd say there are sort of three basic kinds of obstacles. One is intellectual. And that's basically that uh, this is going to, a lot of this, what I've been talking about will be unfamiliar to a lot of teachers. It's not something they're likely to have learned in their pre-service training or in-service training, their professional learning. They may have been told it's not particularly important to build kids' knowledge because they can always look things up um, or it may be boring. So, you know, there may be um, resistance to this idea that it's important to build knowledge and actually kids enjoy it, which they do if it's presented in an engaging way. The second kind of obstacle is emotional. Um, and that has a lot to do with feelings of guilt. Um, which a lot of teachers who've made this switch to content-rich curriculum have told me they've had to overcome. If you've been teaching in a certain way for years in the sincere belief that you've been helping children, and then someone comes along and tells you, actually, you may have been holding them back, that's a very difficult message to take in. And it's very natural for us to raise defenses against accepting that. And then the third kind of obstacle is behavioral. Um, even if you want to change what you're doing in the classroom, teaching is such a complex activity. Teachers are juggling so many things in the moment that it can be hard to remember to do things differently. It's very easy to just slip back into longstanding habits. Now, none of these obstacles are insurmountable, um, but they will take time and support um, and probably professional learning. But but not professional learning as we have known it. So not a half day workshop on how to foster critical thinking in the abstract. To be effective, professional learning should be rooted in the content of the curriculum, the specific content. So how to boost critical thinking about Greek myths, if that's what your students are learning about. The second thing that needs to be uh, in place for professional learning to be effective is that it should be cyclical, and collaborative. So teachers may be coming together, talking about something new they're going to try, going back to their classrooms, trying it out, and then coming back and talking about how it went, and then talking about another thing and the cycle repeats. So that's what can work. Um, it, it's, I've seen it work. I'd just like to end with um, by sharing an anecdote that I heard when I was doing the research for the book, The Knowledge Gap, when I was out in uh, in Nevada in the United States. And I heard about a, a second grade teacher whose school had recently adopted one of the recently developed content focused curricula. And she uh, was giving one of her students a test to determine his individual reading level. This was a struggling second grader. She saw in the kit that there was a passage, a test passage on the topic of westward expansion. So the pioneers in the American West. This happened to be a topic that the class had just spent two weeks learning about. But this passage and this test passage on westward expansion was at a fourth grade level, and this was a struggling second grade reader. But just out of curiosity, the teacher handed the passage to the boy, and he read it to her surprise with 98% accuracy and 100% comprehension. And that experience undoubtedly changed that teacher's idea of who this boy was and what he was capable of. And it probably changed that boy's idea of who he was and what he was capable of. And this is one reason I feel so much urgency about spreading the message about the importance of building kids' knowledge. Uh, we're doing untold damage to so kids' self-esteem, their self-concept by telling them, just practice your skills and strategies and you'll become a better reader. And if that doesn't happen, as 
but often doesn't, those children may feel they have no one to blame but themselves. And there's no reason for that. So thanks very much for listening and um, I will stop there.